I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and pay my respect to the elders past and present. Um, so today we're going to be talking about setting up a modern JavaScript, JavaScript project. Um, I do apologize in advance that I'm currently sleep deprived and haven't had much. So if this feels like rushed, it's because part of it is, and I will welcome feedback at any time during the session and also after as well. Um, so uh, again, today's goal is to demystify JavaScript programming because I think we're all different uh, kinds of backgrounds and people using different languages and not everyone is using JavaScript and that's perfectly fine because uh, different languages have different strengths, certainly. But if you haven't used JavaScript before, or you have, and you haven't done too much into it, um, today's goal is to kind of tell you more about what JavaScript does, and um, hopefully you'll get something out of it as well. Um, so if you aren't on mute, can I please ask you to put yourself on mute for the moment? Because I can hear some buzzing. Um, okay. So as I said in an email earlier, um, the motivation for you to attend this talk is that uh, if you want to just write a product that you can link someone uh, so they can look at it right away, there's no installation required. You want to write code that works on pretty much all platforms that has a web browser, um, or you just want to you know, add something that can make your web page a lot more interactive or better in some way, um, or you've never used JavaScript before and you want to get started quickly, uh, knowing how to debug is really useful if you just you know, got tired of console.log to print stuff, and maybe there's other tools you haven't checked out yet. Um, or maybe you're not a programmer and you just want to kind of familiarize yourself with jargon so you can, um, as a product manager or as a other line manager, you can talk to engineers about stuff. Um, and lastly, if you want to find out how others manage their JavaScript projects, this is a good place um, because I presume people who attend this talk are interested in managing JavaScript projects, especially with the uh, latest JavaScript versions uh, in 2015 onwards. This will be interesting, uh, so it will be the right place for you. Uh, I do want to mention, though, that uh, this talk is not designed for you to code alone, even though there will be quite a number of, of examples. Um, I will try to go through concepts so that uh, in the future when you read other articles or um, blogs about JavaScript, um, this will help you get along. And also the entire presentation will be available. I've done this on Dropbox paper for an experiment, so I'll share that with you at the end of the talk and link down in Confluence. Um, also, the slides are not exhaustive, so uh, every slide you can probably feel like, oh, this could have been done this way, or this language has done this already. Um, I don't want to mention that because that's going to be the case for every single slide. However, if you're confused about anything, uh, feel free to interrupt me and say, hey, Xavier, uh, what about this? And I'll tell you uh, what about it. So if you're good, we'll go. Right, so this is intended to be a series of uh, three parts, I guess, um, for JavaScript stuff. Uh, I was I started writing this with three parts all kind of scaffold out, and then after about six hours in, I realized the first part is already an hour long. So today we'll just go through part one and is talk about learning JavaScript. And this section will be, uh, well, first of all, I will explain to you what I mean by modern JavaScript so that um, when you look at websites that talk about JavaScript that may have been posted in before 2010 or after 2015, there's different syntaxes and it's a bit confusing, so I'll try to clear that up for you. Um, I'll go through a couple of basic features so that if you've never seen JavaScript before, at least you will know what a variable is and how to declare a function. Uh, I'll provide a past and future proof setup so that your uh, code that you write will not only work on, I don't know, IE 10 or in browser from two years from now. There's many ways that JavaScript community has done uh, to make this possible, and um, why not write code that works not only everywhere, but also anytime. And also, I'll go through a couple ways you can debug uh, near the end of the talk uh, by showing you the web inspector as well as a couple of useful functions and tell you how to print the stack tricks, which for some reason by default is not there. And hopefully at the end, we'll answer some questions that you may have. Um, I won't try to post the problem. You'll have to come up with it because I'm only here to give you the answer. Uh, the section, however, will not discuss anything too specific like how do I scrape a website or how do I write a drop-down menu or image compression. Um, I'm going to try to very, very hard to avoid any web frameworks that you may or may not be using right now because I intend this talk to be uh, framework agnostic and more focused on the core JavaScript features that's coming up in the last two years. And also, there's so many pipelines now that you can uh, do your production building for JavaScript, and I've listed three there. I will briefly touch on Browserify just for the uh, sake of being able to use something, but that's only 
uh, listed later on as a command line tool, and I won't go into how to best uh, optimize your JavaScript builds because I think it's important also just to look at what features that you, you may not have considered yet. And in the future, we'll look at other things like server-side JavaScript called Node.js and also other tips and tricks that I didn't get time to include into this talk because it just got a bit too long. So we'll focus on just uh, client-side JavaScript and just on new features. So uh, quickly to go through some foundations, so uh, if you don't really know what JavaScript is, uh, it runs everything on your browser, really. Um, so by default, JavaScript is implemented probably in C++, in like Chrome and Firefox, and um, all the uh, user interfaces like your uh, bookmarks, I don't know, your um, status line, it's all actually powered in JavaScript. And um, naturally, uh, People's websites can also include JavaScript that allow you to run code to fetch perhaps database queries. Um, you want to find out what maybe the stock market is. You want to find out what someone's profile, what someone's Facebook posting about. That's all uh, fetched over JavaScript interactively. So JavaScript really makes interactions possible in the web. Otherwise, uh, we, without it, you will only have HTML, which is just a static uh, file that defines articles and hyperlinks. And you will have CSS, which I don't talk in this uh, presentation, but that just gives you the style, but it doesn't give you any more complex interactions more than, say, hover. So uh, JavaScript really drives interaction on the web. And also, um, I won't talk about that in this part, but I will mention that web servers can be coded in JavaScript to handle asynchronous tasks, uh, which I will touch on briefly at, uh, near the second half of the talk as well, just on the asynchronous part of it. So what does JavaScript have as an advantage? And I included this section because maybe you don't know why you will use JavaScript. And um, that's perfectly fine because if you're doing statistical analysis or if you're doing something to do with uh, looking at simulating uh, molecular biology or using natural language processing, to be fair, JavaScript doesn't really have any libraries for it. That's mature. However, these are some general cases that you may want to use JavaScript for uh, if you're considering for your project. So as mentioned before, it provides uh, browser code execution. You can run code on the browser, which you can serve over the web. So on any web page that someone else may want to see, uh, it's quite easy to just give someone a link and say, hey, check out this web page, and I can do some computation there or some processing there. Um, also, JavaScript, which people realize but don't really think about, has access to many browser media controls. That means your webcam. Uh, that means perhaps your microphone, uh, mouse and keyboard naturally. Uh, if you're on a phone or if you're on a geolocation GPS enabled device, you can get locations uh, and so on and so forth. And so JavaScript actually has a lot of built-in interesting tools that really enables uh, you to use people's sensors and actuators should they have any on their devices. And these are all across uh, standardized in the HTML5 uh, spec. So if you want to use something like someone's microphone, but you don't want to painstakingly trying to figure out what kind of microphone they have, have to call the browser vendors. Driver API, JavaScript sort of encapsulates all of that into one thing and you can just call it, so it's quite easy to use. And finally, since about, I don't know, eight years ago, uh, JSON, which is a really common data format on the web, um, is also native in JavaScript. So if you just write any uh, valid JSON syntax in your code, JavaScript will be able to um, compile that as JavaScript objects, which you can use in your code, which is quite useful. And by compile, of course, I mean compile into bytecode, not compile into uh, binary. So what do I mean by, by modern JavaScript? I'm focusing on features that's been supported by browsers uh, since a spec called the ECMAScript 2015. So this was published in June um, by a committee called TC39, which defines the standard for JavaScript. And uh, while there's no other languages that implement ECMAScript, um, JavaScript is the only language. Um, it does tell uh, browser vendors what features to include and also what functions and how they should act. So uh, there's been quite a number of features that's kind of available already by modern browsers in at least the latest two versions. And I want to focus on those features, or at least some of them. Um, however, there is a more recent uh, spec called ECMAScript 2017, which I will only mention uh, one feature of but that's upcoming and they're being drafted. So now I want to go through a couple of uh, just basic stuff about JavaScript so uh, we can be on the same page about um, what JavaScript is like. Uh, first of all, uh, JavaScript is functional. So what that means is uh, function, functions are uh, first class objects in JavaScript. And what that means is uh, 
in addition to both languages that you can define functions in a block, like Python and Ruby or C, uh, you can define functions inline in JavaScript and the same syntax will work. So that function add I defined there with A plus B, I can easily assign that same syntax to a variable and that variable is not a function. So uh, this allows you to pass functions around quite easily. You don't have to write function pointers. You don't have to write handlers like in Java. So um, it has a certain advantages for certain programming paradigms, which we'll go into later. Um, also, in the latest version of JavaScript, or at least ES6, uh, they introduced error functions, which just changed the syntax from function to a double equal sign and greater than. Um, I should mention quickly that ES6 and all the features that's coming out um, are not removing features. It's going to be backwards compatible. So this is in addition. So in addition to writing functions of name and then parameters, you can write just the parameters in uh, optional uh, parentheses if there's more than one, and then you write a double arrow followed by your function body. So uh, this shortens the syntax quite a bit, and it also allows you to access uh, a reference value of this, which I won't go into, but it lets you write uh, nested calls a lot easier without having to uh, save references. And also, uh, you can, I'll just use my mouse, hopefully you can see it, uh, you can also write functions in one line like this. So that really shortens the function description quite a bit and makes it much easier to read, especially when you have lots of functions nested each other as well. So another myth is that JavaScript people think is not type safe, but in fact, the proper saying is JavaScript is dynamically typed. What that means is they're typed at runtime and the variables don't know what the types they are until you run them, which is very different from not being type safe. So JavaScript luckily has only, um, I would say, what, five to six types. So first of all, there's functions, that, that's one type. Um, you can be a Boolean, so you can have true or false values. You can have a number value, which is uh, the floating point. So in JavaScript, one thing people get tripped out about is that they don't have integers, it's all floating points. So if you understand that, then it makes a lot of calculations a lot easier. But if you write one or zero, it's actually a floating point. Um, it has string, which by default for the longest time, over 10 years now, is Unicode and encoded in UTF-8. So it accepts both double quotes and single quotes, and because it's Unicode, you can also have emoji, which is great. Uh, in terms of complex types, or what I would call it iterable types, there's basically two of them. You have arrays, which can have um, objects of any type you want, really. You, you can have numbers and strings in the same array, that's fine, because JavaScript stores by reference. And if you just have a pair of double square brackets down there, that's an empty array. And also you can have your usual normal objects, which are written in a similar to the JSON syntax, except that the uh, key before the colon can uh, omit the double quote if you're familiar with the JSON syntax. So in this case, I have an object and it has one property called color, which the value is yellow. So that's how you would define object in uh, JavaScript. You can also write an empty object just by having an empty pair of um, braces and assigning to variables as well. Okay, so in addition, JavaScript also has two built-in uh, falsy values, which would def uh, be evaluated to false if you try to put in an if condition. That's no undefined. And you can use no to just kind of pad variables out, or undefined happens when you're trying to access something that hasn't been defined yet. Um, now, I want to mention uh, JavaScript ensure type safety via the principle of programming on, uh, by contract. And I'll go into this later, but I realized uh, later on that I actually didn't write this section in a talk. So I will talk about it at the very end of the talk, um, but please remind me if, if I forget. And this principle is directly borrowed um, by the Python community, actually. So another thing, uh, JavaScript has three kinds of variable decorations, at least uh, since the latest uh, version, which is ES6 and ES7. So there's three ways to declare variables there, var, let, and const. So for the longest time, JavaScript has always had var since like the second version or something. It defines function scope variables, which some people might not know about. So if you're familiar with a C or you come from, say, Java background, where uh, the language is largely inspired by C, variables are in block scope. So any pair, uh, two pairs of braces is a block, and your variable lives in that uh, block. However, in JavaScript, variables at least when defining var, lives in a function. So in this case, I have a function called bark, and uh, it checks for the visitor, there's an owner, this is how it barks, that's the sound it makes. Uh, if it's not the owner, then this is the other sound that it makes. Uh, in this case, you can see that I've defined sound uh, in the if-else block, which in other languages would mean that sound will actually not be defined when you're out of it. But in JavaScript, uh, please keep in mind that 
variables are defined in the function scope. So the moment you hit var sound, anything inside from that line onwards in that function will actually have access to sound. So in this case, if I do console.log, which is the print statement or function in JavaScript, I can actually uh, print the value of that variable ne near the end of it. And I do apologize for the syntax hiding. Um, Dropbox paper is not smart enough to know what JavaScript is, apparently, which is a bit annoying, but that's okay. Um, also, so there's let in const. Um, let is block scope. So if you're really, really keen on just using block scope uh, variables, let lets you restrict that. So if you try to uh, access sound with the exact same uh, uh, example, uh, sound in this case will be undefined because let, just like most C languages, um, will only live from the beginning of its definition until the end of the block. So that sound and here in the else block, uh, that sound will end here. So in this case, this sound will be undefined and you will actually get an error if you run that in strict mode or in, well, hopefully later on in modern JavaScript. Finally, uh, const just lets you define a constant. So what that means is a constant reference, if you're familiar with C. So if you try to reassign a constant with, to a different value, JavaScript will say that's a type error. And this may be useful to track um, single instances, especially when you're loading functions and modules. So another example is to set an object uh, to a constant reference. So in this case, I've used a object that has one attribute called color with value of black. So if I try to print it out, I can evaluate it with cat, and cat will tell you oh, it has one, it's, well, one attribute with the same value. Uh, however, even though I declared cat as a constant, it's a constant reference, it doesn't mean that the value inside has to be constant. So what that means is I can still modify the attributes of that cat, say from color to uh, black to white, and then if I try to evaluate it again, I can now have a white color. And so this makes it really useful if you want to make sure that you're always referencing the same module or the same function while necessarily keeping its uh, attributes. So if you're instantiating an object and you want to make sure you're accessing the same object, const will be a pretty damn good uh, type checking, actually. If you're really, really keen on using static type checking, const is one of the ways that browser will tell you hey, you're accessing now a different variable, and this is why. Um, is const a uh, function <coughs> scoped or block? Const is block scoped. Okay, only var is function scoped. So what if I redefined the color of the cat to be true instead of a string? That will become true. That would still work, right? Yes, yep. so if you do color, uh, if you do cat, then it will say color true. Right. So you, you have to keep that in mind. You yeah. still have the property of color. Though. Yes, yeah, yeah. So you have to keep in mind that you can always uh, reassign a variable with any value. Yeah. That includes any value of a different type, um, which is very interesting when you're trying to work in JavaScript, um, which is also why I want to talk about uh, programming by contract later, because that's how we ensure programming style we code in JavaScript. Don't get rid of things passed in that doesn't make sense. So can I add keys to a cat? Yes, you can just can easily I say... Can key from the cat? Yes, you can do use it uh, using the delete keynote. So you can do delete and then cat.color, It'll be gone. Okay, so I want to walk through some common patterns that you can use right away, and I would encourage you strongly to use today. First of all, uh, if you're iterating through an array, uh, just in case you have never used JavaScript, people will go, oh, I'm coming from C, I'm going to use a for loop. Please don't. Uh, use for each function, and there's a number of reasons for this. Um, one is because JavaScript defines variables in function scope, as I just mentioned. So anything you declare in here will live in that scope. Uh, otherwise, if you do like, you know, for i equals zero, i is less than blah, 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 i plus plus, and you write something to iterate through stuff, and because you're storing temporary values inside your for loop, and you're using var, what that means is that var is now gonna be out of that for loop because it looks for the top function, and then you have really weird variables that get defined everywhere. So just for type safety, I really recommend you to use this for each function. And this function is defined uh, in the array. So for any array such as this, one, two, three, and because this array is a valid JSON, I can just declare it that way. I can call for each. And then inside will be a handler function that would just go through each one of these. In, in this case, this is a function that takes the one argument, and all it does is it prints it out. So uh, as a result, if I run this code, I will just print out one, two, three in three separate lines. Uh, you can also iterate through objects. Uh, the most type safe way to do that is to use object.keys uh, instead of the foreign loop that some people may be inclined to using in JavaScript. And same reason, because this way you can use for each and it encapsulates all your values in a function, which is very useful to make sure that your variables are not leaking scope. 
So here I've defined a cat, which is a black cat and is seven years old or seven months or whatever something. And um, I now use object or keys as a function of built into JavaScript to get the keys, which is color and age, out of this cat, which will re return an array of those two values, but they should be strings. I should probably fix that. Um, and then I can iterate through those strings. So if I do a console log and I say, what's my thing and what's the value, it would then give you the string of color, which is the value of black and age and seven. Um, so that's quite useful if you want to iterate through an object property. I should mention that uh, for those of you who are familiar with JavaScript, um, it has what we call prototypes. So if these things were inherited from other things, um, you might get really things when you use the for you to iterate. When you use object like keys, you will not get that. You will only get the attributes directly for this uh, object, which is very, very safe. The next thing is to uh, use the map function. So if you want to transfer, uh, transform an array to a different array, uh, you can just use the map method, which then you also let you pass in a function. In, in this case, I'm just writing it in one line because it's a relatively short function, and here I'm just doubling it. So running that code will return me from 1 to 3 to 2, 4, 6. And the next thing is if you want to update an object, uh, as Sam was asking before, you can just dot something, and then now you have a new property called name. So here I'm naming the cat Kiki. If your property has a space for some bizarre reason, maybe you're passing uh, some CSV files that have a space in there, you can also use the square bracket like you access uh, arrays in most languages. And now what happens, oh, this milk should be a string, I should fix that. And now what happens is that you have a cat um, of four properties and with a name and also another property that will be uh, looking like this, but you can always access it with the square bracket. But just so you know that when you do the dot something uh, syntax, that's a shorthand of converting that to a string in the square brackets in JavaScript. Uh, selecting HTML, just in case you haven't used that before. Uh, since about six years ago, uh, document.coreselector and selector all is available now. So you can all stop using jQuery because I'm pretty sure 99% of you use it is to use the dollar sign to select elements. Um, so this is available, I think, even up to IE9. So there's really no reason. So for example, if I have a uh, unordered list in my HTML, which has two docs, spot and dotty, I can use the query selector inside document and I use my CSS selector as you would do. So hash is for IDs in this case. So if I do uh, hash dog space Lee, it will give you just the first one that you find. In this case, it will be the element of the list spot or the list object spot. If I use query selector all in this case, it will try to go through the entire document and returns you a list of everything it finds and it always returns uh, an array. So in this case, you, know, you expect to be spot and dotty. Okay, so if you want to iterate through HTML nodes, in this case, um, there's also a really useful property called char nodes. So in this case, if I use the query selector to get the docs diary ID uh, div tag, it may or may not have some diary in there, but I want to find out what's inside. I can get the char nodes property and then call for each. So for each then will allow you to pass in a method or a function to handle it. In this case, the paragraph will become, the first one will be the heading one, and the second one will, will, will be the paragraph tag. So if I print it out, I would just get exactly that. Um, and uh, finally, if you want to modify an HTML element, uh, well, you just assign the inner HTML of any element to a string. And now you have something inside the HTML. Uh, so if you want to use your JavaScript, this is how you include it, just in case you've never seen that before. Uh, I do recommend it to include it at the bottom of the file if you can. And now congratulations, you have now learned to crash course into JavaScript and you can move on with the good stuff. Okay, so for now, I'm gonna take a quick uh, one minute break. Is there anyone having any questions they want to ask me? Okay, uh, feel free to interrupt still. Now let's look at some new features. Um, so what are some useful ES6 or ECMAScript 2015 JavaScript features that's coming out and supported by most browsers already that we can use? Uh, first of all, there's destructuring, which is very interesting. Destruction lets you declare variables or functions with the uh, array or object literals. So what that means is instead of just assigning a variable by one value, I can now assign a, what looks like an array of two variables to an array of two values. But what this actually does, this is a shorthand to say, uh, let x equal zero, y equals one. So now in your scope or whatever this scope is, um, you will now have access to variables called x and called y, and they will have those values. If the length doesn't match, it will just get the first two. If the length is too short, y will be undefined. 
Um, you can also do that for objects. So say, here's my cat again with my black cat seven years old. I can also assign variables called color and age, um, and they have to match the keys for the object that you're trying to uh, destructure. So in this case, uh, you will now have a variable uh, called color with the value black and called age with the value of seven. If you have variables in here that's not in the object, your variable will be undefined. Um, also, you can um, declare functions that has what looks like an array or an object, but in fact, you're just saying this is what the function takes, which is A, really great, because now in that function, you immediately have access to the uh, thing called A and B. So this is really useful if you're passing like geospatial locations, which has longitude and latitude, or if you're pa passing uh, geospatial extents, which has minimum longitude and minimum latitude and maximum of the same thing. Instead of trying to pass that one thing and assign it to four different lines, you can just do that in one go. So in this case, if I call it middle and then I pass an array of 0, 1, it will execute that and give you 0 0.5. So that's really useful. The cool thing is that you can mix and match them and nest them in however deep you like. So uh, this is really cool because one, it tells you exactly what the function will require, uh, which is uh, which alludes into programming by contract, but I'll get into it later. In this case, save order takes an object because you can see the function definition uh, has an object literal in them. The object expects um, two named attributes, such as quantity and name, and it also expects something that looks like an array, which is longitude and latitude. And then I can pass in this to um, my function, which will then run. Uh, and in that function, in that scope, you will now have function name long and left, which is very useful. Uh, I do want to point out there's a caveat. If you don't define the key here for the uh, object called geolocation, uh, some compilers or some parts of Babel might not translate properly, so you may want to say geolocation equals this. Uh, but either way, this is how you will get um, objects into a function's definition. The next thing I want to look at is template strings, uh, which is I, I think it exists in most languages now, and it's nice that JavaScript finally has it. So here I've got a dog who's bolt. And I can say, my name is Bolt, and I want to access the object's uh, property. I can use the dollar sign braces and passing any JavaScript in here, but my string is quoted with backticks. So in, in this case, if you quote your string with backticks, JavaScript knows to evaluate anything that looks like dollar sign braces pairs and inside them. So now that will give you a line um, with those things replaced. Template strings can also be used for multi-line things. So in case you're calling a poem, uh, I can just write as many lines as, as I want here, really, um, and I can still evaluate, say, the bird name and the bird model, which will give you exactly everything that you put in, uh, except with those things replaced by the properties or any variable values. <coughs> you can also put in things like expressions to add, modify, call function, that's all about it too. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is transforming objects. Uh, so in addition to just assigning an object's uh, property like cat.name equals kiki, in ES6, uh, you can also use a function called object.assign to assign and update an object with a different object. So in, in this case, I've got a cat again. This is your familiar cat. And I want to say, I want to assign this property of name called Kiki. Um, then the cat will become that. This is useful if you want to merge two objects in JavaScript and they all have multiple properties. Um, if you merge two objects and the properties on the second one have the same key as the first one, you will overwrite the first one. It's uh, in two or more. You can do three, four. Exactly. Yes, uh, you can also have two or more objects uh, mm -hmm. add, like after after the assigned things. So that yes. Uh, also, I want to look at modules just very briefly and quickly. So in ES6, it finally introduced a module pattern, uh, which you can have. You can split JavaScript files in multiple files, and you can refer to them back and forth, which makes it really useful. So in this case, I may have a math library called maths.js, and inside that, I'm going to give you a keyword called export, which tells this uh, module what is available. And in this case, I'm exporting an object, which has two properties, and they're both functions. <coughs> so it's add and subtract. Hopefully, it's very self-explanatory. Uh, you can also write stuff in modules that aren't exported. You just have to make sure that that's not uh, prefixed by an export uh, keyword. So in another file, you can now import that module. Uh, the full syntax is import star as some name from a file. So assuming your file is in the same directory, this is how you will refer to it. And you say input everything um, as math. So now in this case, uh, once you've done that in the ES6 syntax, you can then use math to add as you would expect uh, to get any modules out of that. So you can now call that function. If you only want to import certain things and not everything, because sometimes libraries are huge, you use this structuring. 
So in this case, I just say on the info subtract. So uh, that will give you a subtract uh, function in uh, your scope and you can call it. If you still want to encapsulate that subtract in something else, you'll want to use the import destructuring as something. And then now you have something like that. Or if you just import maths from maths uh, and don't use the star, if you have your module written properly, you can also use maths star subtract. Okay. Oh, going through pretty quickly. The next thing I want to talk about is asynchronous function calls, which is getting much better in a modern version of JavaScript. So uh, you're probably familiar with the term AJAX since 2006. Uh, it's actually called asynchronous JavaScript and XML, which is kind of confusing because almost no one uses XMLs anymore for modern JavaScript projects. But anyway, you can use function calls that uh, may take some time and you don't know when it finishes. So as an example, there's a built-in function in the browser called window.setTimeout. It just lets you delay a function execution by some milliseconds. So in this example, I'm calling a function that takes no arguments. This is how you define it. And all the function does is it prints out a thing in your debugger called one second is up, and I give it 1,000 milliseconds. So in this case, once you run uh, that line, after one second, uh, JavaScript will faithfully execute this function, and it will do this. Now the thing is, because everything inside here is asynchronous, this can print out any time between, I don't know, 999 milliseconds to 1,001 milliseconds in between the other code that you're running. So uh, it gets a bit tricky. But if you're working on the web and you're getting things like someone's picture profile, you're loading new tweets, you're trying to find out if someone's login or not, and you're using uh, asynchronous calls, this is very important to master. So uh, in ES6, they do introduce this pattern called promises, which makes it easier to use. Um, I won't go into too much of it, but I want to point out that uh, promises let you resolve or reject things that uh, will encapsulate your asynchronous calls inside functions that's quite useful to use. And uh, as an example, I'm going to use um, Fetch API. So this API is available on pretty much modern browsers and Edge. Uh, if you're defined for IE, there is a polyfill, which is just a um, someone basically implemented Fetch in JavaScript. So you can use that in IE as well. And I will go through uh, the JSON example in this case. And I'll combine that with promises, and I'll show you how I uh, handle asynchronous calls in a modern JavaScript. So uh, if you're familiar with how people used to do asynchronous calls, it's complicated. Different browsers have different ways to do it. It's confusing. Fetch unifies all of that. So all I have to do is I call this function called fetch. It's built in. Um, and I give it a URL. So in, in this case, here is an example API someone has uh, made. And I just want to fetch one, perhaps, blog post, if that's what it is. Um, when you do promises, uh, so fetch re returns a promise, it gives you two methods you can handle. One is called dot then, and the other one is called dot catch. They both accept functions. So you'll be very used to passing functions in JavaScript uh, from if you start using it because functions are first class. But anyway, uh, inside the first then handle, I'm going to say this is the response. I'm going to call it. That's my variable. And I'm going to use uh, fetches.json uh, method to transform uh, the response data, which is just binary and bytes, into a JSON object. And then the next thing I'm going to do, you, you see how I'm using the second dot then, is because the response.json is also asynchronous, because at this point, the browser actually hasn't finished decoding it yet, because that could be called any time. Uh, so in the next step, when it's done, I'm going to say I'm going to call it data. That's just my variable. And I'm going to print it out. And just in case the uh, fetch failed because the server is down or your internet isn't connected, I'm going to catch the error right here and then print it out in the console as well. So in any of these steps, if the, res the response here fails because it's not a valid JSON, or if the browser fails to fetch anything, or if for some reason console log the, the log is not defined because you're not on the browser, this will catch the error and print it out for you, which also prints it out on the console. But there's many ways you can do it. You can throw errors and things like that. So uh, if I just do this and everything runs fine, um, all I'm, and all I'm doing is printing, I will just get this JSON output. Say, for example, that might be the content and the title of the blog. So um, now the important thing to point out here is that, again, I want to emphasize fetch returns a promise, which if you haven't seen before, I have uh, readings you can do uh, are linked at the end of this talk. Um, but to, to just take that in mind that, uh, to keep in mind that, it will return something at some point in the future. You don't know when. So to make sure you always catch it when it's done, uh, you, you use the dot then and the dot catch for the successful and the failed states. So I just want to quickly go back again. Um, this is how you can do um, 
asynchronous calls today. Uh, except for IE, you just need to include a polyfill, which you can include as a JavaScript in one line. It's quite great. All right. So um, you can have more than one then as well as we showed before. Um, and uh, you can also make your own promise objects, which I won't go into. But uh, again, the reading is uh, included in the talk. All right. Uh, the latest version is ES7. I'm going through this very quickly. Uh, there's a new uh, pair of keywords called async and await, and it came out about two months ago. So it's available on, again, all browsers except Edge version 15, which is the next version of Edge that's not quite out yet. And again, there is also polyfills you can use. And by that, I mean you can just use a JavaScript implementation of it instead of the native uh, C++ implementation. So you can rewrite that fetch example. Do you remember we did a fetch and we say, this is my URL. And instead of using uh, dot then and then do a bunch of functions and then dot then do a bunch of functions. I can encapsulate this in an async function, and so I just write async before my function statement. Um, I can also use async function and then this as well, so that's just a shorthand. Um, and before each promise, I need to use the keyword wait. So this tells JavaScript that this function right here is as asynchronous. You don't want to finish just yet, but pause here. So what this changes is that now this code becomes an uh, imperative coding, so it's just line by line. You don't have to say, oh, I don't know if the code after this line is going to be executed before or after, unless they're encapsulated. In this case, I can literally assign a variable uh, by the value that this function is going to return. And the execution will hold at this line until it returns as well, which makes it really useful for both reading and debugging. And I can have more than one away. So I can just have another one that you know changes into JSON, which is also a promise that may or may not be done at some point, because browsers may need to download a larger file. And But once it's done, I'm going to print it out. Uh, however, if you want to use um, error handling, you use try catch blocks, you just like this with console error. You can also put the uh, dot catch at the end of these promises as well, but this is probably the cleaning way to do it at least at this stage. And finally, because it's wrapped in an async function, you have to call it. So that's down there. Um, well, the advantages for these functions are first of all, it supports imperative coding styles, so you can just have let function equals something to download, let something equals something you have to transform, and then print it out when, when it's done. You, you don't have to write callbacks too much into uh, trying to make sure it's done and then trying to have everything in the callback. Uh, you can also declare variables to share. So I want to go back here. Remember how JavaScript variables are function scope? If you uh, were to write promises, which is fair enough because sometimes they're really useful to use and you want to say, cache some temporary variables in this function or in this function, they're not going to be shared across each um, promise handling because they're in a function. However, if you write things with the way ES7 async await does, now this is not in a function anymore. So you can declare variables, you can uh, calculate, you can cache whatever you want, and at every stage of the uh, asynchronous handling, you can also share those variables too, so that makes it very useful. Um, and also you can have more than one await statement. So in case you have more than one thing that needs to be done one at a time in some uh, order, async await makes it really easy to follow. You can say line one, line two, line three, that kind of thing. You don't have to trace functions and callbacks anymore. So um, now I want to mention that there is still valid ways to write promises or to write callbacks or whatever. There's no like one, one reason to not use async await, but in some cases it may be good to use them. You just have to try them out and see what works for you. Right, so another thing that everyone's waiting for. Setting up a modern JavaScript project. Um, before I go on, is there any questions that people may want to ask? Right, okay, again, feel free to interrupt me. Um, so to do that, you click on this link, which you can go to. It's node.js.org, or you can get to it at the end of the talk. I'll share the slides. Um, you want to install that via the desktop installer. It adds a package manager to your command line. If you don't know what a package manager is, it's usually a command line utility that lets you search and download or uh, remove any third-party libraries that you may want to install for your project. So you, you don't have to hunt for a Git repository on someone's Bitbucket anymore or on someone's GitHub repo. You, you can just find it on a package manager, which people can also publish to. And it makes uh, ma managing dependencies a lot easier. And to manage the dependencies, it creates a file called package.json. It has to be named exactly like that in a top-level directory. Uh, so to make one, because you might not know what to go inside, um, there is a command that you can use to create one, and I'll walk you through. 
So assuming once you install it, just assume that you've installed it and you've got the command called npm on the console or the command line. In the folder you want to work in, just run npm init. And what I would do is it would initialize a npm project package in the current directory and it will create a package.json file. Um, I have a disclaimer that there's other package managers that you may already be using, but I'll focus on npm for the talk. So once you run npm.init, it will print out a bunch of things, like it will walk you through, and there's a bunch of helps you can do, and this is how you install this, so on, so on, so on. There is going to be a series of questions that you can uh, respond to, and then it will fill it out for you. So it will say, what's your name? I'm going to call it Awesome Project. What's the version? Maybe it's 0.0.1. Uh, you can give a description, you have an entry point, uh, by default it's index.js, so I left it alone. Uh, I didn't put in any test commands or repositories, but if you had any Bitbucket or Git repo that you want to put in, this is where you will put, it in, uh, put them in. Uh, it can give some keywords, put in your author and then your license. If you're doing open source, it could be MIT or BSD, or you can say C license in this file. And once you've answered all of those questions, um, it would basically write, into uh, this entire JSON object in your package.json. By default, if you don't give it any tests, it will just say no tests specified, but that's okay. You can always come and change it later. And so that's how NPM knows uh, what the, the, the project is called and where it keeps all the dependencies we're going to next. Um, so again, this is how uh, they manage the dependencies. And also, if you want to publish packages in the future, you need to supply pretty much the same package digestion. So it's very useful and a good habit to keep. Uh, to download the dependency, if you know what they're called, you can just do npm install. So in this case, I'm using dash dash save as a flag. Then it will add the dependencies uh, object if it doesn't have ready in my package.json. It will find a library called lodash if, if that's what it's called. And then it will find the latest version and inserts that in exactly. So the caret here, which it inserts for you, is it's saying it's exactly 4.7.4. So this is really good if you're uh, working with a um, library or two that someone else is writing, and they updated it to, say, version 5 or version 6, and they introduced some breaking changes. You can still get to version 4 if you're using that. So it makes sure that what, whatever you're working on won't have random break, breakages in the future if someone updates the library. But you can always update them later. Uh, if you don't do dash dash save, then you will just install it without adding it to your package. So that may not be so useful, but you can do it to try things out. Xavier, if yep. you wanted to pin to 417, would you put the carrot where before the 17 as well? No, so that 4174 is exactly 4174. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you do 4175, you yeah. will not get it. Yeah. And, and I mean, there's a list of uh, symbols you can use as well, which I linked at the end of the talk. Yeah. You can do. Uh, between so some versions, tilde and stuff. Yeah, you can do like about kind of that version. You can do greater than some version and so on. You can also do tags like latest or RC2. Um, another thing to emphasize, if you're using a version control tool like Git or Mercurial or <coughs> SVN, you can use package.json and include it in the repository. And this is important if you're working with a team because if you're adding a third-party library that someone else isn't using yet, uh, you can just uh, include package.json, uh, push it to your repository, and then when someone pulls it back down in, on their local working copy, they can just run npm install. And what this will do is npm will go through every dependency in your package and you will find the missing ones or incorrect versions and update them, which is pretty good. So it saves someone having to uh, run like manually writing all the libraries like you do in Python, which is why I use Anaconda, but anyway. Uh, to remove, you can just npm remove or npm uninstall, and you have to do dash dash save again with something you want to remove. If you don't uh, remove with the keyword or the flag here, save, it would not remove it from the package, so it's important to keep that. Um, you also notice that when you um, <clears throat> install some library, there will be a folder called node underscore modules in the working project directory. Um, if you haven't seen this, just believe me, there will be a folder called this. And um, if you use, again, Git, uh, don't add that to your uh, repository because those libraries are third-party libraries that everyone is using, so there's no reason to keep a copy of all of them. Um, so what you should do is, you, for example, if you're using Git, you shouldn't add that folder to your Git in your file, which tells Git what not to add. Um, and lastly, just briefly, if you're really wanting to use this on a global scale, which you shouldn't be, but if you do, you can use npm uh, dash dash install with 
dash g that will install it to your I think user local node or something like that uh, folder. Maybe it's no module somewhere so that everyone has access to. However, it's only everyone on your machine, and so that's not very useful. But if you're using it on the command line, maybe it is. Right. So once you've done that, like you've installed Lodash, for example, you can now import as we did before. You can in, you can import everything as some variable you would like to call it, and then now you can have access to everything inside that library. For example, there is a function called head, which is just return the head element of any iterable stuff. Right, so how do we use all these features in your web projects? Since we now know how to uh, manage dependencies and add and remove, how do we use it in our projects? Which goes into about path proofing and future proofing the projects. So there's uh, many browsers that people are still using. I think IE 11 is the latest supported browser that Microsoft supports. Microsoft dropped IE 10 last year, I think. Um, or if you're still on some phone that's like iPhone 4, you probably don't have the latest iOS browser either. Uh, or if you're trying to experiment with features that you want to use and you know it might be available, but at the moment your current browser doesn't have it, you can still use it actually. Uh, it's just that you have to compile it first. And this section will go through briefly how we compile or how we call it in JavaScript transpile, which is translating to a different version of JavaScript uh, so that you can write code uh, in as succinct or as beautiful as you like that's already a supported spec. It's just that browser isn't caught up yet. So there's a tool called Babel. Uh, you probably have already heard of it if you looked into JavaScript. It's a compiler that translates JavaScript into a past or a future version if you wanted. And it will try to generate human readable JavaScript um, so that the functions won't be mingled and you can still kind of see the function structure in general. And um, I didn't properly define polyfill before in the slides, but this is what it is. They're just functions that's implemented in JavaScript. So this is how Bubble makes it available. Um, if you are calling things like object assigned, and it's not available in your browser yet because you haven't updated Chrome for like three months, then you can include a polyfill for object that assign, um, and then that function will, will be available, which makes it useful for uh, backporting for or past proofing for older browsers. Um, Transpiling looks like this. So if I just use the previous example before, like the middle function, and this is what I write in a modern version of JavaScript, when you try to transpile it back all the way, this will date all the way to IE7, I'm pretty sure. It would include a polyfill. In this case, this function is called slice to array. And it just uh, converts an iterable to an array. And then uh, in here, it defines a function. Uh, it's still called middle. But then it's replaced your function definition with some temporary variable that's using internally. And then it transformed that thing to two variables which you can use inside your function. So from here, you can see the function is the same. I'm just returning the middle of the value A and B, just like this. But it adds a polyfill, and it changes a couple of things so that uh, whatever you compile will still work on all the browsers. And this is really useful if you want to make sure you're targeting 99% of the browsers out there instead of like 68% or something like that. because. Not everyone has the latest version of Firefox or Chrome, or you might be using features that isn't quite out yet. And this ensures it will work all the way down in IE7, which is great. So um, another thing to mention is that you should really keep a project structure uh, in your JavaScript structures. Um, this is one way to do it. There's no one universal way people do. But generally, you would have package.json. You'll probably have no modules on top level. And uh, as an example, I've just in included the common uh, source and library. So you'll write all your source code in source. Anything you transpile will be included in a library, which you can include in your web page. Uh, so how to install this? Again, you can just install it via npm. So you'll do npm install. And here I'm using dash dash save dash dev to say that this is a developer dependency instead of a project dependency. So if you were to deploy this in the future, uh, NPM won't include Babel, so you don't have to include the transpiler to someone's website. This, that doesn't make any sense, but you can use this for developing. Um, so in this case, I'm using uh, the command line uh, Babel, and also a preset we'll go into later. Another thing you have to do is you have to go into package.json and then add a build script. In this case, uh, this is how you would tell NPM how to call Babel. So I'm just saying Babel, and then this is my folder um, with a destination folder. So I'm going to transpile everything in source to uh, library. So that's pretty straightforward, hopefully. Finally, you have to use a uh, preset, because Babel since version 6, and this is about half a year ago, has made everything modular. So by, def by default, it includes nothing. 
And this environment preset uh, lets you specify exactly what browser you want to support, which is very useful. Um, by default, it supports all the way back. So you need to create a new file called uh, .devilrc, which is on the top directory of your project. And then um, once you've done that, uh, when you run uh, npm run build, which will call the script that you specified here, um, it will then find that .devilrc file and then use the default preset, which uh, will backport everything, which is very useful. However, if you don't want to backport everything, you just want to backport to only latest versions, and you might want to say, oh, my boss uses, I don't know, an iPhone 5 or something, and I want to make sure that his phone will still work, you might want to specify for his Mac, and then later on maybe iOS is greater than or equal to 7, for example. Um, and this is how you will specify your targets. So in the preset for the environment, you can say, I want the latest two versions of all browsers, uh, and specifically, I want to support this. So you can be confident that whatever uh, code you're writing will still work for browsers that didn't know about the future, which is great. There is one more thing I want to quickly go into, um, which I don't want to go into too much because I know people are using different pipeline tools. Um, but there are tools that let you bundle scripts so that you can use it in the browser uh, because by default, Babel still compiles it into a module that will only work for that file but not for other files. But if you want to import them, you'll have to somehow bundle it. So in, in this case, I'm going to go through an example called Browserify. I won't go into what it does, but I'll show you how to use it. Um, so you can run these things and try it out. So to do that, you install Browserify and a plugin called Babelify, which is a plugin for the, uh, this tool to transform everything into one uh, JavaScript file. And then you want to change the build script from, I'll go back a little bit, uh, the Babel source to library. Uh, to using Browserify, and in this case, you only want to specify your main JavaScript project with the uh, transformation uh, called Babelify, that's my plugin I installed here, and then I want to up output it to the library also called index.js. So note that you don't need to include the whole folder with this setup, uh, you just need to include the main file, and then uh, Babelify and Browserify will find everything inside that you're importing and then bundle it into one file. So once you've done that, you can do an uh, npm run build again, which will run a file, and now you can include uh, whatever your JavaScript you, you got in your HTML. And the beautiful thing about this is that uh, you're only downloading one script, so you can save some requests, which isn't important for HTTP2 anymore, but anyway. Another thing is everything you write here will be encapsulated under a functional scope, so it won't leak anything into the browser main thing, so this script will still play nicely with other people's scripts. Okay, so I understand there's only four minutes left, but that's okay, because when I was writing this slide, I also ran out of time to write. So, debugging JavaScript. Um, I want to quickly mention Ctrl Shift I is how you open a uh, web inspector. So I'm on a browser, so I can import, or I can open, oops, spoilers, I can go to this, and then now I have the uh, browser inspection tool right here, because everything here is on the web. Uh, in IE, you use F12, and in Safari, you have to enable that in your preferences. So I'm going to scroll back now because this changes my slide order, which is terrible. So there we go. Now, uh, another note is that if you're debugging transpile code, you need to insert a uh, source map. And then you, you might inline it, you might put it to a different file. But source maps basically tell browsers where the original code is and how it maps to the transpile code. So when you do a debugging, you don't have to debug all the underscore rest stuff. You can debug it as if you're writing a newer version of the code. If you use Browserify uh, with the example before, you use the dash dash debug flag, which just insert like that one, dash dash debug right here, and then everything will have uh, source maps, which makes debugging quite easy. Uh, so as I showed you before, this is what it looks like. Uh, it could be on the side or on the bottom, and there's a bunch of tabs on the top of your web inspector. If you've never seen them before, uh, you usually have some of these. So you can see the HTML elements, you have a console, that you can execute code on. Um, you can look at the different sources like JavaScript or PNGs or whatever you've got. You can look at the network requests if they're successful or failed. You can look at how long it took to from getting a request from the code to painting the web page. You can profile them if you're really keen on making it fast. You can also check out your tokens and cookies in your application. And finally, if you're using any SSL certificates, security shows you what you're using, as well as any enabled things like webcams and microphone, because by default, they're not enabled. So uh, another cool thing that people might not know is that, and I have to show you this. Oh, then I spoiled it again. So say I'm selecting this body right here. Um, it's probably too small. I'm going to make it bigger. You see how there's a equal equal um, dollar sign zero? Some people don't know, but 
if they want to access this object right here, you can actually just do dollar sign zero, and this will give you the exact object that you're selecting right now. So if I now scroll down to say this div tag, and I do dollar sign zero, I now have selected a div tag. So if you want to do on like you know in the browser debugging and you don't want to select because it's really difficult to select some object, you literally just get it right there. It's really useful. Um, I'll just keep this uh, here like that for now, so I can still try it. You can set breakpoints. <coughs> so in your do -do 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 sources in my code, uh, this is not my code, this is Dropbox, but if they have any JavaScripts in here, which I can't see, you can set uh, debugging points and you just do that on your usual line, um, line count, I guess, but I can't show you here. Uh, however, if you do have it, you can just click on the side uh, or you can add this little keyword right here, debugger. This will only run if you're running in the browser and browser will set breakpoints right there. So then you can now do step and things right in this panel. There's a couple of really cool login values, which I'll go through in the last minute of my talk. Uh, you probably know about console.log. Uh, you probably know about info, warning, error, but they're quite useful if you want to just say, you know, suppress all warnings and whatever. And if you have written your code this way, you, you can then separate out the different levels of importance for your logging. Uh, there's a really cool thing called console.table, which I'll show very, very quickly. So it lets you um, print out uh, a list of objects. So for example, I might have a species and this thing's a cat and it has an age and maybe it's seven years old and then I might have another species and this one's a dog and another age of say nine. Uh, if you call this in console.table which takes an array of objects, it will give you a table. Uh, this is really useful if you don't want to go through like, if you just want to print something out and you just get this crazy long things of things, um, this makes it really easy to just kind of see what you're looking at and then it's lined up by the property as well. Um, and if there's any missing properties, you'll get an empty column or empty row for that column, which is quite great too. But you can still you know, go through it with the old fashioned style. This is how you want to inspect it. It's really painful. I recommend console that table. Uh, finally, there is, uh, th this is how you print stack trace. By default, JavaScript errors, when it happens, it only gives you the error like type error, this is not a number or something like that. Uh, if you want to go through the whole stack uh, directly in your logging, this is how you would do it. You will create a new error object and you just get a stack. And then you might do console error or log or something, but this lets you record uh, and log stack traces for debugging later on, which is quite useful. Right, so uh, it, this is now two o'clock, uh, so I'm gonna wrap this up. There's a bunch of links that I'll link it to you at the end of the talk by linking you this uh, Dropbox paper. And um, I don't know if we have time for questions, so uh, you, you're welcome to stay up uh, for another 10 minutes if you like, I'll be here. Otherwise, feel free to email me. It's david.sr.au. Um, and um, just to sneak preview, there's the next two parts uh, because I found out there's too many things I'm trying to say. <laughs> so uh, the next part, uh, hopefully if it happens, I'll talk about server-side JavaScript, which is a, a library or a environment called Node.js. It's a little bit different but it's mostly the same. And uh, finally, I want to talk about, at some point in the future, some just good practices for writing modern JavaScript code about how you would do testing, how you would uh, try different things on the fly, um, and just kind of give you a bit of a stepping stone. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll be here for 10 minutes if there's any questions. Nice. Uh, very well structured um, demo. Uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. I've got no questions, but I'm happy to check on future JavaScript. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. No. Uh, you're welcome to just send it to me. Yep. Expect an email explosion. <laughs> That's fine. Yep. Okay, I guess there's no questions. Uh, feel free to email me. I'm on Slack as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.